II, only in industrialized nations, was there a group of people called mostly women who were not the poor women, but rather the middle class women who were married to men who were successful enough to be able to provide women with enough income to not be able to have to focus on survival, that the women were able to say, the middle class women were able to say, I want something more from this relationship than my husband being a wallet. I want a man I can communicate with. I want a man I have common values with. I want a man who listens to me, respects me. I want a man who can express his feelings. I want a man, I want a real relationship here. I want love. And so she went out and checked it out with her psychologist, and her psychologist said, yes, you're right, he's wrong. And, the, um, and, and then she checked it with the Oprah Winfrey show, and they said, yes, he's, uh, she's right, and he's wrong. And she checked it with the, re the relationship books, yes, she's, she's right, he's wrong. And she began to be able to say, um, I am growing, my husband is stagnating. Why was she able to say this? She was able to say this because her husband was providing enough of a security blanket, usually in the old days, to be able to free her, to be able to question things that because he was so preoccupied providing that economic security blanket, he was never able to take his head out of the sand and do that re-examination himself. I made one mistake there. I said he was never able to. Yes, he could have done that. But the very nature of the type of man that she selected among the more successful men and not among the more conscientious objectors was the type of man who was unlikely to select himself out to do that, pre, that internal re-examination. She didn't sele select from the introspective, she selected it from among the football players. What did the football players learn to do? The football players, I don't mean the literal football players, the football players are just the high school version of the metaphor for the successful man. They're the, they're the high school version of the doctor, the lawyer, the engineer, the top author, or whatever. And what that football player learned to do was to do everything that all top men tend to learn to do, which is to cut off our feelings. And who encourages them to do that? Other men do. And also the woman does. The cheerleader goes, first in 10, do it again. Now exactly what is she saying? First in 10, do it again. She's saying, I'll give you my body. This is the body that I'm going to be giving you. By the way, you can take a look pretty far up. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and if you do it again, that is, if you, hurt, if you hurt yourself again in the process of carrying this ball 100 yards, I will give my love, my body to you rather than the man who doesn't do this effectively enough. <laughs> and so we <laughs> learned to call it power to go out there to hurt each other and get the love, not only the female cheerleaders. Now suppose this guy didn't effectively take the ball across the yard and hurt himself you know, uh, week after week, month after month. Would the and, and he lost his position in the team. Most guys learned that they never saw a female cheerleader come up to him and say, you know, I was noticing as you were playing football that you were really warm and tender and vulnerable <laughs> and open and you seem to manifest wonderful listening skills um, <laughs> and enormous empathy for the other perspectives that have, other than your own. You had a sort of inherent sort of orientation for diversity. She noticed rather that, he noticed rather, that the next week if he lost his position on the football field, was the cheerleader still cheering? Yes, she was cheering, but she was cheering for his replaceable part. <laughs> she was cheering for somebody else in that uniform number seven. And see if you can notice who the number sevens are. You barely see their faces, they're so covered up. They're just one more person taking that uniform. Watch the next football game next week and notice how we as commentators and myself included, applaud, as the termites having a fire drill, um, the, uh, we applaud the man who continues playing football even as he's hurt, even as he has two dislocated shoulders, even as he's, he's, as, as he's in pain. And so what we taught the man to do was when he experiences pain, to continue, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. So when that woman in stage one started to discover herself and say, honey, pay attention to your pain, your hurt, get in touch, go to a psychologist with me, come to marital counseling with me, re-examine, introspect, the chances are she, in falling in love with the football player type, the doctor, the lawyer type, the engineer type, she did not fall in love with the man who was most prone to say, yep, notice I got a little scratch right here, I'll check it out, um, but rather the one that will say, no, don't worry, I'm not a pro I don't have any problem. The result of which is that he's now called male. 
And as male, whether it be black or, or, or white male or Hispanic male, he's likely to die seven years sooner than women. He's likely to die earlier of, every, of all 15 causes of death. He's likely to die, um, he, he die almost as often as prostate cancer as women do of breast cancer. And he's likely not to protest the fact that we fund breast cancer more than 700% more than prostate cancer, even though he dies almost as much of prostate cancer as she does of breast cancer, because he's learned that when the going gets tough, he's rather die than complain. He didn't get love or respect, not just from women, but from other men, not just from other men who were his peers, but from his parents. The parents came out and cheered him to do child abuse on the football field. We just called it education rather than child abuse. Um, if we did that same thing to women, if I, if I were the principal of a school and you were the females in the school and you were age 15, and I said as the principal of the school, girls, the way you're going to get the love of boys is you're going to go out on that field and you're going to bang your head against other girls. And if you do that week after week and you keep catching this piece of pig skin, the guys will love you more. You'd all be intelligent enough to go home and say, I think the principal is advocating violence against women. We go home, we call it scholarship potential. And so we've learned to call something love, and we've learned to call something power that any other group has been trained to call powerlessness or at least to question or to call violence against them. What that has led to is women falling in love with men who provided the framework of success that allowed them to escape, escape from the preoccupation with survival of stage one and to move into what I call stage two of self-fulfillment and leave the men behind because the men that they married were the type of men who were prone to free the women but not to free themselves. That left the women very angry and upset at partially themselves and partially men, but even enough upset at men that they said, I want a marriage where I don't feel like I'm a prostitute, where I feel like I'm a full human being, where I feel like I'm heard. So the woman then filed for what? Divorce. And when she got the divorce, she went out into the workplace. And as she went into the workplace, she discovered in the 1950s and early 1960s that the workplace treated her as a full equal or that it discriminated against her? That it discriminated against her. Was, did that make her happy or angry? Rhetorical question obviously made her angry. And so she became angry, but she was also started to notice that the workplace was not about just fulfillment. The big reason now she was out in the workplace when she was divorced was because it was out of what? Necessity. And so part of her was learning workplace necessity, even as at the same time she was getting messages that men dominate the workplace because they have power and fulfillment. And, and uh, so there was a little bit of a, a cognitive dissonance that she was living with. On the one hand, she was seeing that the workplace was necessity. On the one hand, she was hearing that it was all male power, that they had the whole slice of the whole pie. So the next, the next level she moved to was to say, well, well OK, but I'm still a, a female now. I'm single. I'm, I'm now eligible for love again. And she found that she was in the marketplace of love, but she was with men who were often falling in love more with 220s than 140. Uh, she was 40 years old, and she, they were falling in love with 220-year-olds. Um, and, and did that make her happy? It made her darn angry. So we had a situation where she was angry because she was the most beautiful person she'd ever been in her life internally, but the men were addicted to the younger female because historically and genetically that was functional for the female. When the men got addicted to sex with the beautiful young woman, she, the guarantee was to take care of that woman for a lifetime. But for the first time in history, that guarantee was not kept. And so as women began to be divorced, they had grown up with an expectation that marriage would mean a lifetime of economic security and suddenly they were economically insecure at the age of 40. And they weren't just women. They were women with two children. They were a package deal. So if I fell in love with you, and you had two or three children, and I really began to be close to you, and I felt understood by you, and, and you said to your, 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 your other friends and your parents, I know he's in love with me, and it came down to marrying you, I might say no, and you'd say, you know, I think he's afraid of commitment because he's afraid of intimacy. And I'd go to the psychologist and I'd say, I think I'm afraid of commitment because I'm afraid of intimacy. But in fact, what I was afraid of oftentimes was the combination of supporting my wife, my, my ex-wife rather, my, um, my, my children from the former marriage, 
the mortgage on a home I no longer lived in, the apartment that I presently lived in, getting involved with you supporting perhaps part of your two children, yourself, the likelihood that you would feel guilty about taking time away from your children so you might quit your work or cut back to part-time at work in order to be more involved with the children now that you're married. And so what I am committing to is economic responsibility. And my fear is not the fear of intimacy. My fear is the fear of economic responsibility that's going to do this with me. Instead of taking me more toward you, it's going to take me more away from you. I'm going to turn my back toward intimacy and go toward the workplace. The more, and so that we see statistics about married men earn more than single men. The reason married men earn more than single men is because as we take on the responsibility of the families, we're willing to prostitute ourselves to the workplace in a way that we weren't before when we were, when we were single. There's no group in the country that's probably more discriminated against than gay, gay people, or gay males, maybe with the possible exception of fat women. Um, but the, but, the, but as, as the gay population does that, one of the reasons that there's such discrimination against gay people was because in stage one, there was discrimination against everything that did not lead to what? That did not lead to children. There was discrimination against masturbation. There was discrimination against sex with beasts. There was discrimination against, um, there was, I mean, such a nice, wonderful thing as sex with a local sheep. Uh, there, was, <laughs> there was discrimination against that. There was discrimination against every form of behavior that did not lead to procreation that was protected. Extramarital sex, sex outside of sex outside of marriage, anything that led to sex without without that wasn't protected, and so gay people were not saying I want to have sex that with with that that would lead to children, and they were discriminated against. Any man that could not the common denominator of all men, black, gay, Native American, or white, is the pressure to succeed. The anger at men increases to the degree to which they do not succeed or the degree to which they succeed and in the process of succeeding, ignore intimacy with the woman. So black males have always been ridiculed recently in America by, white, by black females because they did not provide as effectively as they wanted to. Native American males were very respected until Native American males did not protect women effectively enough to be able to protect them from us that came in from overseas. And when they couldn't and they were confined to the reservations of their defeat, they lost respect. When gay males did not protect women, they, didn't, they were ostracized by everybody, males and females. The pressure on males of every background is the same. The difference between males of backgrounds is the degree to which they get the education and the skills to do the protection. The difficulty with that back and the difficult difference between black males and white males, particularly African American males to a large degree, is that African American males had a heritage that was very different than every other ethnic group that came over here. Every other ethnic group that came over here, we gave them one basic message, and that is the message that if you were a slave, basically, during your lifetime, if you were that 70 hour per week cab driver, if you were the indentured servant, there would be nevertheless a reward that your children would live lives that were better than your lives. That was the reward. But to the African American man and woman, we gave a different message, and that message was, if you work really hard and you enslave yourself during this, your lifetime, you will make a slave owner rich. Great incentive, huh? And so we have a different background and a different heritage, and we are paying the price for the creation of that anti-incentive system that we gave to African American males versus white males now. And we need work to do to overcome that and to change that and to re-educate that, both for the people that created that atmosphere and also for the people who are part of that atmosphere. The basic background, though, for all males is you will not get love if you don't get money. And the basic message to women was, you will get money when you get love. The basic message to males was, you won't get love unless you get money. The basic message to females was, you will get money when you get love. I'll explain that more 
we come back from break. I'll be doing an experience later which will really, I think, help deepen this awareness, be getting into some issues about other issues about why men are the way they are, getting into the sexual harassment issues, getting into the hazing issues, getting into what a diversity program would look like that would be inclusive of the white males without hurting or excluding women or minority groups. But I'd like to take a 15 minute break now and then come back and, and cover those issues as we come back. Thanks very much. Where did it start again? I was suggesting in the last um, section uh, a, basically a paradigm shift of what, in the way we look at the issue of power. And I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about some of the implications of that and then move into another exercise and then spend most of the rest of the time just sort of talking among ourselves about some of the implications of what I've been saying in the application to Bill Atlantic. Um, the, one of the things that has happened in the last 25 years as a result of this, of this what I think of as a, an overly adversarial paradigm of male patriarchy and dominance versus female oppression um, is that we've, we've nurtured a tremendous amount of misinformation that has fed us into that, that belief system that we had, that underlying a false premise. The types of things that hurt me, or not hurt me, but affected me when I was on the board of directors of NOW and that I started to begin to speak up about was the t following type of information. I and other members of NOW would start saying things like, you know, women are often working two jobs, men are working one. And we, women, for example, will often work outside of the home, and yet, statistically speaking, we know that women work 17 hours more per week inside the home. Then I would start doing the research for why men are the way they are, and I check out. I always force myself to check out the original source of each data, piece of data, and I would find out that yes, it was true that the Journal of Economic Research found that women do work 17 hours more per week inside the home. But then I would read to the next line, and see in an asterisk, follow the asterisk into the footnote, and find that they had also noted and found in the same study that men worked an average of 22 hours per week more outside of the home. I would then bring that up to my now colleagues, and instead of saying, oh, that's an important thing, we have to bring that up in our next presentation, um, thank you for helping us see the whole picture and see it in a greater amount of balance, that makes me feel better about the fact that women aren't overly doing all the work while men are deadbeats, I got rather daggers from my now colleagues' friends, like, how dare you mention that? Are you against us now? Um, and I would start saying, wait a minute, what I thought this was about was about equality and about love and about trying to understand both sexes, not about trying to figure out how we can play the best victim. And as I began, to, so from my perspective, I would have been very much opposed to any men's group that only presented the information that men work 22 hours more per week outside the home, as I would any women's group that only presented the information that women worked 17 hours more per week inside the home. What I wanted was information from both sides of the scale so that we could get a, an, a larger picture of what is happening and so that a woman who was coming home from work could say, if I want, if I want to 
let me look at the whole picture of how much am I working outside, how much am I working inside, how much am I doing the repairs in the lawn and painting the house, how much am I commuting, um, how much am I doing work that is, feels obligatory to me that I wouldn't otherwise do versus how much am I doing work that I enjoy doing and trying to, because, uh, but not necessarily taking a job that pays more that I like less. And that all of that needs to go into the mix of the male-female discussion, but if she's reading in women's magazines that guess what, you're doing two jobs and he's only doing one and not looking at that whole picture, she's going to be carrying around anger inside of her. And that anger inside of her is going to come off on her husband, her relationship, her ability to love, and her children as well. And I think that that type of misinformation was feeding the system. The other type of misinformation that was very easy to feed was the belief that, well, you know, it's basically men earn a dollar and women earn 59 cents for the same work. How many of you have heard that? Okay. As far as I'm concerned, as long as that is true, there cannot help but be anger toward a feeling that men have basically created the system to serve themselves and oppress anybody else that doesn't, doesn't fit into that. As long as I believe that, I held some of that anger toward men and to, toward the patriarchy as well. As I started researching that statistic, I began to see that that was also very, 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 very much in doubt to this type of degree. I don't have a chance to go over all the parameters of that, but I'll give you a little bit of a sense as to the types of things that make me and make us need to question that. First of all, I was wearing 59 cent buttons with now at the, at the point in time that the US Bureau of Labor Statistics was already saying that men earned a dollar for each 72 cents that women earned. So there was a 13% gap, but I was fascinated that we were, had no problem wearing the 59 cent buttons uh, even when it, when it was a 70, 72 cent difference. But from my perspective, that's a minor point. What I began to do in my research on that piece of data was I called up the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics and I said, is this true that the 70, it was now 76 cents and it has been 76 cents for quite a while, um, the difference between the full-time working man and the full-time working woman? And I happened to ask the question, by the way, how many hours per week does the full-time working man work versus the full-time working woman? And they said, well, when you add part-time jobs and full-time jobs together, the full-time working man er works an average of nine hours more per week than the full-time working woman. Stunning. Because when anybody works nine hours more per week than any other person, be they the same race, the same sex, or whatever, they make a very significantly greater amount more money for reasons that do not need to be explained to an intelligent group of people. Um, I then said, are there any other differences? And they said, um, yes. Well, actually, they said no. It was not until I started researching it until I started finding out that there were very many other differences. One of the other differences is that the average man uh, who works full-time commutes two hours more per week than the average woman who works full-time, meaning that he's willing to go further out into the world to find a job that usually that pays more and, that's, and that fits his qualifications more. We also found out that there were seven basic characteristics that women's versus men's jobs had. I referred to one of them a bit, bit more a, a bit earlier in the program when I, when I said that the, the men who were that the, in, when you have 90% or more male jobs, like um, they're usually exposed, what I call exposure profession jobs. They're usually out in the cold, in the snow, in the sleet, in the rain. I guess in Bell Atlantic, that would be more likely to be the installers and the repair persons and the uh, linemen and so on that are much more likely to take jobs outside. I started asking if, if women were competing for these jobs. And at first I got answers yes, but as I started checking with the individual employers, I found that the answer was in fact no. No, that women were not competing for these jobs. They were competing to be doctors, they were competing to be lawyers, um, but they weren't even competing that much comparatively to be engineers. But yet the important part of this information is the following, that mechanics in any field who are females earn slightly more than mechanics in any female who are, who are males. So I was, I was checking out with the person who drove me down to the airport um, that he, he was preparing to be a PC repair person. And he said, it's the only field I can enter into where there aren't women competing for it. And I said, PC repair person? There are no women competing for it? He said, no women competing for it. And yet PC repair people make good money. Mechanics who are females make more than mechanics who are males. Engineers who are females make more than $571 more per year the first year they are employed as engineers, the males who are um, engineers, but after two or three years, the males earn more because for a number of reasons, they're willing to take jobs usually in locations like Alaska that nobody else wants to go to, which is why you have seven men for every single woman in Alaska. Um, <laughs> good place for anyone, single female, might have <laughs> some information about. Um, the, uh, they, they are willing to do, um, 
they're willing to work inconvenient hours to a greater degree, and particularly those differences are increased when what happens? They get married. When they have children. Get married, a slight increase, but the big increase is children. And so that the real, so if you look at the 19, 60, and this is not a misstatement or misquote, if you look at the 1960 U.S. Census and you look at women who have never been married and never have children and compare them to men who have never been married and never have children, guess who earned more? Women who had never been married and never had children. That was true in 1960. It has been true ever since then. But the difference was when women and men have children, women are still today, as of the last Census Bureau data, 43 times more likely to leave the workplace for six months to a year or longer to be with the children. The difficulty is that very few workplaces pay people who aren't there um, and, and, do not, and, and uh, promote people who aren't there. And so the, when the woman is married and has children, the expectation is that the man she is married to will increase his intensity of uh, preoccupation with work. Now what we have been doing in the past 25 years is we've been having the women read women's magazines about the, the, the experience that they have when they, they get married and basically the woman learns when she's married and she has children that she has basically three options. Option one is if she, to be full-time in the workplace. Option two is to be full-time with the children. And option three is to do some combination of both. Uh, particularly if she's married to a successful man. But her successful husband, if she's married to a successful man, sits and observes her generate those three options, and he generates what I call three slightly different options. Option one is to work full-time. Option two is to work full-time. And option three is to work full-time, exactly. Or work overtime, time and a half, or work or work two jobs, particularly if he's a working class man. And so he starts learning that when, so what the woman does is she reads about her dilemmas, her juggling act, her attempt to try to, in the women's magazines, to, to, to tear her apart about saying, my goodness, if I put all my time into my children, that's gonna be wonderful for the children, but yes, will I, my career be sacrificed? If I put all my time into my career, I'll be gonna be neglecting my children, I feel guilty about that. If I do a little bit of both, I'm gonna be a jack of all trades or a or queen of all trades, but not, a, not at the top of all the trades, and I'm gonna be instead of dealing with that type of Thing. So she is reading in her women's magazines the empathy for the juggling act that she's going through, but is the man reading in his men's magazines the empathy for the intensification to the workplace act that he's going through? Uh-uh. He's reading about sports, about business, about politics, um, about um, Playboy centerfolds, but he's not reading about the, uh, the commitment to the workplace that he's going for, through, and therefore he's not understood, and yet he is calling himself the powerful one because he's devoted to the workplace, Whereas the powerful one, in my opinion, is the person who's able to generate the most options and then decide about what type of value system do I have, what type of desire do I have, and how do I tailor my value system and my personality to what I would like to do in life. And so what I'm asking men to do is to understand the importance of interacting with women. This is not women's fault because men haven't spoken up. Women cannot hear what men do not say. And so far, basically, men have said nothing. They put their head in the sand and hoped the bullets would miss. And so, the, um, um, so we often hear that, that we have a battle between the sexes. We really don't have a battle between the sexes. We've really had a war in which only one side has shown up. Women have spoken up and said what they need and they feel like and they want. And men have basically, as I said, put their head in the sand and hoped the bullets would miss. But that's not speaking up. And what I'm saying to men is, why haven't you spoken up? And what's the men's answer? They don't know why. But on an intuitive level, I hear that when men start thinking about these issues, they start telling me that they're afraid that if they do speak up, they'll be demoted at work, they'll be demoted at home, that they'll have less love, that people will withdraw from them emotionally. And so part of men's difficulty is that we have put all our emotional eggs in the basket of our wives and our women friends. And the fear is that if we say something that the woman friend doesn't like, or our wife doesn't like, and she withdraws her love and her emotional intimacy from us, we have nothing else to go to, no one else to go to. 
We don't learn to go to our colleagues at work because if I'm an assistant vice president here and you're a vice president and I say, gee, I'm having some difficulties at home, you know, I think I might be on the verge of divorce, well, you maybe will listen to me for three minutes and you'll have a three minute window of opportunity that I'll have to sort of talk about my personal problems with you. After about three minutes, you'll sort of glaze over. And if I don't pick up the fact that that, that means get back to work, shut up and get on with it, uh, I, I basically, the next time a discussion comes as to who should be promoted, you or me or yourself, um, you'll say, well, uh, Warren's having a few problems at home, maybe we should leave him behind and promote somebody else. I begin to learn that expressing my feelings to somebody who I've learned to live with and be a colleague of during the day, I can't treat that person as a friend if, I, if the feelings that I express are vulnerabilities because that will lead to demotions rather than promotions, and so I start beginning to fear opening up. The result is that we fear, open, we, we put all our emotional eggs in the basket of women friends, whereas if we get into an argument with our wives, our wives can open up to who? Their women friends, and often do. And they talk about those problems with their women friends, but we don't do that with our men friends. The re and the result is that men are very fearful of speaking up about what they want uh, or what they feel because they're afraid of all of their emotional eggs of intimacy being cracked at the same time and having nobody to turn to. So as men have not spoken up about these issues, a lot of information has gotten circulated that has made it seem that men have dominated a system that has been in a way that served only their self-interest. And yet a little bit of basic knowledge goes a long way to helping us understand that it's not quite that way. If we just ask ourselves a logical question, if men earned a dollar for each 59 cents that women earned and Bell Atlantic hired only men the moment MCI hired only women, it would be producing a, a, the same work for 59 cents. The, the chances of Bell Atlantic surviving selling services for a dollar that MCI was selling for 59 cents for a very long period of time would not be a great deal, very long. And if a, if a man couldn't figure that out, a woman could um, just as easily and hire all women and, um, and create an all-women um, company and outpace um, the company that was hiring only men for a dollar for the same work that women were doing for, for that period of time. It just didn't make economic sense, yet that doesn't mean that people who hire do not discriminate. It means that when they do discriminate, they pay a price for that discrimination. That price is having inefficient people do the same work for a higher price. Fortunately, the punishment for discrimination is built into the, the system to produce a product at a cheapest, the cheapest price uh, for the, uh, the, the, the most work and the most effectiveness at the cheapest price. The, what I'm asking us to look at then, as we look at the whole issue of diversity, is to say that, is to start looking at all the factors that go into making an employee promotable. The factors including who is willing to take the dangerous jobs, who is willing to work the inconvenient hours, who is willing to do the extra hours. And as we do all of that, we cannot do that if we're working from the framework of saying that work is about self-fulfillment and about privilege and about power. But if we're saying that work is also about sacrificing oneself to the workplace in order to get a freedom outside of the workplace for our children or for ourselves, we begin to see that the workplace is about both of those things together. We cannot have a workplace that is so unfulfilling or people will not have any incentive to be at it. And at the same time, we cannot have a workplace that is, uh, that is just serving the self-fulfillment of people. If the workplace was just about self-fulfillment, we would pay to go to the workplace the workplace wouldn't pay us to be there. I've put out a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas, and the, I'm gonna end with the final thing, which I'm gonna ask us to participate in an experience with, and then come back, share the emotions from that experience, and then open it up to any questions and yes buts that you, that you have. If you're a thoughtful person, you'll have not just agreement with me, but you'll also have a yes but about um, what I've been talking about, or maybe 45 of them. And so, um, the, um, 
what I'm going to ask us to do is, since my role here today was to help us see what something felt like from the white male point of view, I'm going to ask us to, to, to do an experience where I'm going to ask um, all of the women here in a moment to uh, look around and ask you, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to ask you to, um, if you're a woman who is 40 years of old, older, um, just to think about that for a moment, or a woman who's 35 years or younger, to think about that for a second. I'm now going to ask the women who are 40 years or older to, in a few moments, to play a role where I'm going to ask you to play the role of a mom. I'm going to ask you, if you're 35 years or younger, to play the role of a daughter. If you're between the age of 35 or 40, or you don't want to acknowledge any age uh, there, I'm going to ask you to, um, to, to play either the role of mother or daughter, depending on who asks you or, or what the shortage of, of numbers of people are in a moment. So I'm going to be asking you in a moment to do something that will allow the women here to understand what affirmative action feels like to the male and particularly to the white male and, and also to allow the men to experience what it, what it feels like to be in the female position and particularly the minority female position in a few moments. So I'm going to be asking the women in a few minutes, to, to in a minute or so, to n now think about which category you're in and to come up here to the front of the room and, uh, with, and on the way up to the front of the room to, to, to pair off with somebody who is in the other category. So if you're 40 or older, to pair off with somebody who's 35 or under, and vice versa. So, but I'll, I'm asking you to, to look around to, for somebody who you feel a type of positive feeling toward. So um, <laughs> that, that, that you would like to have be your mother or like to have be your daughter. Okay, I'll ask all the women first to stand up, and I'll ask um, uh, Russ uh, to ask the people in um, uh, Newark and Philadelphia and J Joe in Philadelphia and Newark to um, have the women stand up. I'll ask the women now to come forward, both in Philadelphia, Newark, and here in the other branches. Uh, women, come on forward. Um, and as you're coming forward, choose a woman that you can pair off with. I'll ask the guys to move up to the front also, but just in front of these chairs here. The women way up front. Phil and Joe, please lead, escort the women right up to the very front of the room. Uh, so everybody should be in groups of two, mother and daughter. I'll ask the guys to come on up to the front rows. And there's one woman in the back there. I think that's a female back there, not a male. Uh, come on up and join the, uh, Sabrina, come on up with her and, um, and join her in the experience. Okay, directions. I'll, yeah, I'll give very careful directions. Uh, yes, both Philadelphia and Newark. I'll ask now the coordinators to do the following with, with the women. Women, is it, first of all, is there any woman who does not have a mother-daughter combination? Is there any woman without a partner? Okay, is there any other woman without a partner? And you, yourself, so there's three women without partners. Is there a fourth woman without a partner? A fourth woman without a partner, please. Okay, now keep your hand raised if you're a woman without a partner. And I'll ask you to, let's say, just pair off um, sort of randomly. Would you pair off with, with her? And then let's see, we're leaving you out. Where's the, where's the, oh, 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 there's two, oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand raised, sorry, um, would the two of you pair off, okay? Yeah, we both, well, one of you, the, whisper in each other's ear who's older and who's younger, and then the, the older one be the mother, <laughs> Okay, uh, Joe, are you ready in um, Newark or Philadelphia, and Russ, are you ready there? We're ready. Okay, was that both of you speaking, or just one? That was Russ. Okay, and Joe, are you ready there? Joe's been assassinated? Yeah, we're ready. <laughs> Joe? He's in Newark. Yes, he's probably been assassinated. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, was that one? Oh, Joe's white. That's right. So maybe he assassinated somebody else. Whatever. Right? Um, okay. Let's see. I'll ask you to look now. I'll ask you to, f to face the person who you are, you are with. And you chose this person for a reason. You felt probably some contact with them, and even if you didn't make believe you did. Um, 
and I'm now going to ask you to sort of share with your partner what affinity you feel for them, why, it, why you feel like you would, in a sense, like to have them as a mother or like to have them a daughter. What, so look into your partner's eye, make believe that your mother or your daughter, and, and, and bond with them for a moment. Do the best you can to bond with them. Ready, get set. Take about two minutes out for bonding time. Um, go. Guys, testing. I'm going to speak to the guys now while the women are talking. Um, I'm going to ask the guys to look over, actually stand up first. And even if you want to stand in a chair and look over this group of women here and choose one woman who you feel you could most identify with as a daughter that you would love to have. Choose one of the younger women, not as a not as a woman friend or a lover, but as a daughter uh, that you would that you would love to have. And what I'm going, what's that? Too young to have children. I don't want to have any. Um, okay, then just do the best you can to choose somebody who's among. If if you um, wanted to have this person as if if you were older and you wanted to have somebody as a daughter, who would it be? Just do the best you can to choose among the youngest women here. Okay, let's get a little bit into the imagination. So, look over the women. Now, what I'm going to be asking you to do in a little while is I'm going to be I'm going to play affirmative action officer, and I'm going to say that you are that until 50 percent of the daughters here are with women that we don't have equality. So that equality is going to equality is now going to be redefined as 50 percent of these children here being with the men. The men, the men who the first ones up there to get the children away from the mothers are the ones that will have custody over their children or access to their children. So they are bonding and your job is to decide who you believe your daughter is and go up there and ask your daughter to come with you um, and to be with, in the custody of you. So we're reversing the affirmative action type of thing. Normally speaking, women have access to the a greater access to the male role in the workplace. Now we're talking about 50% of male access to the female traditional role of being a mother. But what's going to happen with the women is that they will have bonded a little bit with their daughters, and therefore they will resist your coming up and wanting their children. And so they're going to have to deal with re their resistance to their traditional role being invaded and talk about their feelings having that. So it's important that you be insistent upon that as being your right and that you have now the law, I am the law, behind you um, enforcing this because we can't accept that, expect them to be immediately um, willing to do that. Okay, women, I'll ask you to hold for a moment. Up in Newark and Philadelphia, I'll also ask you to have the women um, hold for a moment. I'll now give, now that you've had a chance to do a little bit of bonding with your daughter, I'm going to ask all the daughters to raise their hand. All the daughters, raise your hand. I'm going to be asking the men here in each of the locations to look over the women whose hands are raised who are the daughters. Okay? I, I am now... I am now representing the affirmative action program and the diversity program, and because the traditional male role has been access to jobs, and now we're trying to allow the population to have a, 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 re, a representation in the job community that is reflective of the population at large, I'm now going to say as the affirmative action officer that half of these children should be with the men and half of the children should be with the women. So the men are now looking over the women who they would like to have be their children and they will approach, they will approach the daughters 
and take the daughters with them until 50% of the daughters are with the, the fathers. You as mothers can either say, okay, let's work out an arrangement, or you can say, go, um, uh, you can say, go for it, um, never wanted you anyway. Um, or, you, or you can say, no way, am I going to let you, let you go? This, this person is not as qualified as I am uh, to take care of this person. And then we'll be talking, so I'll be asking you now as, as mothers, uh, yes, you can, you can, you can, you can, the, these are the, the, the fathers, oh, fathers, uh, yes, and presumably therefore probably the ex-husbands as well, okay, <laughs> sometimes, right, <laughs> okay, so I'll be asking now the, the guys here, to imagine yourself being the fathers of a daughter up here, choose a daughter of your choice uh, to be your daughter, and the mother, what I'm asking the mothers to do is to feel whatever you feel inside of you, just be in touch with that feeling, and from that feeling, register it, and later we'll talk about whatever that feeling was that was coming up inside of you. Okay, daughters, one more time, raise, keep your hand raised. Men, each man should have his eye on one daughter. Wait, hold for one second. <laughs> this was his fatherhood. His fatherhood instinct was moving him, right? <laughs> yeah, he, remember, these are daughters, not lovers, right? <laughs> okay. Ready? Get set. Guys, in all locations, choose one of the daughters. All daughters in all locations should have their hands raised. Ready, get set, go. Now the, now the fathers, I will ask the fathers. Oh, my God. Uh -oh. <laughs> We've already decided that mothers are more uh, Keep going. Mothers are, mothers are more revered in the That's culture right. that I'm I will ask the fathers to take the daughters back to the seats. <laughs> fathers, take the daughters back to the seats. <laughs> fathers. Take the daughters back to the seats. Phil and Russ, circulate among the fathers to make sure they're taking the daughters back to the seats, not staying there with the daughters. Mothers, wave goodbye to your daughters. Mothers, wave goodbye to your daughters. <laughs> okay. I will ask us to, I need the um, microphone back. I'll ask us to stay where we are right now. And I'm going to turn to, ready? Hold for a moment. Ask us to hold conversation in all the locations. And I'll ask the mothers now to talk about how you felt about your daughter being taken from you. Talk about your feelings on the emotional level. You couldn't get her away, right? Okay. You, could, you, couldn't, you couldn't get her away. What happened here? We're still negotiating the deal. Okay. And, and who's the mom here? Me. Okay. And so you're, you, how were you feeling about him coming up and possibly taking the daughter away? Great. Great. I just wanted to make sure that um, she was being well taken care of. Okay. Cared of. So you wanted to make sure the qualifications were correct? I was planning to do. First of all, is this going to be you're taking her full time or is this part time mm -hmm. or what were the arrangements? What, what were you doing? What, were, what did you have in mind? Mm -hmm. How we plan to take care of her at night? When can I see her? Mm -hmm. If he needed any uh, monetary reimbursement from me? And mm -hmm. we're just working out the details. Okay. So you were feeling an obligation to make sure this person who was coming for this job was well qualified. 
it mm -hmm. and just and, and could do as good a job of it as, as you. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to have them investigate it. Yes. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> okay. So, so this would be like, uh, this would be like the, the, the man having the woman investigated to make sure that in fact she was what she represented herself to be. Very good. Okay. Anybody else? Um, say, uh, say your name. <laughs> Nancy Stevenson. Nancy. Um, we discussed it and uh, we thought that since uh, my daughter had spent most of her time with me that I would afford her the opportunity to spend time with a father and he seemed like a very gentle man. Mm -hmm. um, so I assumed he had all the qualifications. Mm -hmm. um, and um, she felt that that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. And she said, she would, she said, can I come back? And I said, any time. Mm -hmm. And as they walked away, I started to cry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. It's nice. Dan? Yes, um, Sabrina? I was negotiating with him. I didn't think that he was qualified <laughs> to be who, a who, nurturing who, who, parent. Who was, who was the father? He walked oh. off my chair. <laughs> <laughs> he looks so gentle and loving. Yeah. I don't know, right? Okay, but he's still not qualified to nurture my child. Mm -hmm. um, On what basis did you make this decision? Well, he finally got the child because the lawyer said, take her with her. <laughs> like, wow. So I felt, I felt real powerless. You felt? You know? Powerless. Mm -hmm. He took my daughter mm -hmm. because someone else stepped in. So that's how I felt. Yes. Real powerless. Yes. yes. But I had power when I had my daughter. Yes. Did you feel anger also? Yeah, yes. I did. Yeah. No money coming in no more. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> <laughs> And did, did you feel any injustice? Like, yes, yes, I did, yes. definitely. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, other mothers, speak up. Uh, I'm sorry, any mothers in, um, in Philadelphia or Newark would like to share feelings? <laughs> right. Okay, I'll, if you do, just speak up. Um, yes, can I say your name? Sally. I felt very rejected because I asked her what she wanted to do, if she, if she wanted to stay with me or to go with her father, and she made the decision to go with him, and I felt really crushed, I mean, and, and I felt like a failure as a parent. Yes. Yes. Try to tap into all these things from the reverse perspective, the feelings here of checking out suspicion that sometimes men would have when a woman would take a job investigating, are you qualified, putting you through the, the, the thing, the feeling of rejected, my job is being lost, maybe I um, was rejected, the feeling of un unjust, um, you know, the lawyer, lawyer comes in, the outside government comes in and, and, and says somebody else is more deserving than I am, haven't they checked out the qualifications, all the range of feelings that we can identify with many men having, with many whites having, um, when, when this happened in, in reverse form, so I'm just asking us not, not to make judgments about this, but just to feel the feelings inside our guts as we walk a mile in each other's moccasins. Ultimately, the most important thing that we get out of diversity, from my perspective, is the ability to listen, empathize, feel, and walk a mile in moccasins of people who have a different worldview and a different upbringing and a different heritage than we have ourselves. If all the substance of, of this 20, 30 years from now will make very little difference, whether we succeed as a species or not, we'll be, we'll be much more focused on whether we have the ability to empathize and to listen to people who have different perspectives than we have. And so what I'm asking is just to feel now, is to get into the feeling of what it felt like to have the law say 50% over here and just keep reporting out to me what you, what you were feeling in that process. Anybody else? Any moms? Yes, say your name. Dorita. I realized that we argued over her where she was going, and mm -hmm. I know I told him he had some input else she wouldn't be here, mm -hmm. but we didn't even let her talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, so in a sense, you were equivalent of representing the feeling, well, what does the job feel is the best person for the job? No, I said, and, and, here, and here's my the job is the best. She mm -hmm. needs to be with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't even ask her. Yes. So as time passed, you felt the injustice of not asking the job who no, was the I best? Didn't, no, not at all, because I didn't want him to take her, uh -huh. period. Yes. That was okay. the bottom line. Okay. I didn't even think about it until just now. We didn't even okay. ask her. So your, she, your, 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 your first decision was like, no way, Jose, no. type of thing. No, yes. you're okay. just not going to get her. Yes. <laughs> Good. 
And then as you said goodbye to her, or did you say goodbye to her? No, not really. And I guess I kind of resented him because he took my yes. child. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Yes, say your name. Uh, my name is Loretta, mm -hmm. and um, my feelings were a little different than those that I've already heard. Mm -hmm. I felt a sense of sharing. I didn't feel a sense of loss. I didn't feel that me passing this person over, my daughter over to this person, um, uh, diminished the relationship that I felt. I asked questions about how he could bring value to her mm -hmm. and why did he think that he could. Mm -hmm. And I asked her how does she feel about being with him. Mm -hmm. And she said, yes, she wanted to be with him. But I did not feel a sense of loss mm -hmm. that my relationship with her was going to be threatened. Yes, yes, very good. And you, and you have a perspective that some men felt like, gee, if somebody wants to share my responsibilities with me, please invite them in and have them share it. Yes. Uh, you say, say your name. And, and um, I don't have, I didn't, wasn't talking about the feelings as much as I had a question to ask of you. Mm -hmm. If you pl have you played this game where there are fathers and sons who are separated in this way, mothers and sons, fathers and daughters, and what difference does that make in the reaction that people have? Because it seems to me that would. Um, um, evoke different kinds of emotions. Yes, yes. I've done it with um, mothers with sons, but I haven't done it with fathers with sons because that doesn't mimic the traditional role in reverse. I was trying to hear to mimic the tr traditional role in reverse. The, the, the thing with affirmative action has been that the men have learned to earn the money and have the jobs outside the home, traditionally speaking, and then other people have now been coming in and saying, you know, 50 percent or a certain percentage of those jobs should go to the women or a certain percentage of the jobs should go to minorities. And, and so I was trying to give the women here the experience of what, it, what that was like to feel something that was traditionally their role pulled out from underneath them. So that was valid to do it with the sons, but it wasn't valid to do it with the, um, you know, to, to, to do the fathers and the sons. But the fathers the and the sons. The women traditionally are the sharers. You know, everything I read says that women understand sharing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there might be some very different reactions if you get fathers Good. and Jan, sons. Jan, uh, I want the people in Philadelphia and Newark to really hear what Jan has just said about the, the belief that women are the ones that are into sharing because I think that what, I, what part of the purpose of this experience is is that, that both sexes have a variety of responses about how they feel about having their role interfered with from an outside force. Some of you felt very sharing in your orientation. Some of you felt no way. Some of you felt how dare an unqualified outside source tell me that somebody's going to take my child away from me. Um, and so people who, uh, people who have a role almost always feel uncomfortable and proprietary in addition to feeling partially sharing that when you put the sexes in the other sex's role, you find the same combination of possessiveness, sharing, proprietariness, no way, uh, coming out of both sexes. And the value, I hope, of the diversity programs is to, as we walk a mile in each other's moccasins, that we drop the stereotypes of one sex being more sharing and the, than the other sex, and we realize that as we walk a mile in the moccasins of what the other sex does, that we find that there are sharing, that, that, that in fact, in, inside of all of us, is a part of us that wants to share when we don't feel threatened, and a part of us that feels proprietary when we feel something unjust is happening, and that, and that you only need to change the circumstances, and you draw out of almost all of us all the parts of us that are appropriate parts of us to adapt to a threat. It doesn't help if you're threatened to just be, have the, only the sharing part of you come out. You have to have inside of yourself an ability to defend that which is yours in addition to an ability in times of abundance to share that which you can. Very important point that Jen's making. Uh, say, um, yes, say your name. Uh, yes, I'm Tom Whitaker. Mm -hmm. uh, my experience I think was kind of interesting. I felt like a walking wallet because I got asked you know, how much, can you, we have gifts? Can you do an allowance? How much is child support going to be? 
but no discussion of parenting skills or, and I kept trying to take it back to that. Uh, it, it really felt strange. <laughs> Very uh, Hi, I'm uh, I, I, I sense there's going to be an alternative perspective here. Right? I'm Evelyn, the ex-wife, right. and uh, basically we were asking a lot of questions and money didn't originally come up. However, we got such vague answers that I began to wonder, well, I knew why I had divorced him, apparently. There was, there was no, every question she had because we wanted her to decide where she wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we got no true response as to how it was going to be. It was kind of like, I'll do what's best for you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not an answer for a child. And mm -hmm. so I had to start questioning. But now, a while Evelyn, now address the issue of him feeling that the questions that came to him were questions that were related to his wallet and not to his nurturing skills. I think we started getting into that because it was, well, can you take care of her? Her first question was, can you shower me with gifts? But that's a typical question <laughs> for, for a daughter. And the child support. <laughs> and, and apparently, you know, we just kept asking questions and it eventually got into money, but there wasn't now, any... he's saying it didn't eventually get into money, that it was questions about allowance, about child support, about gifts, that it was all money questions. Evelyn, your response to that? That's, I don't see that to be true. I think we started off kidding about it, but then we didn't get any nurturing answers. Okay. We now, didn't feel that he was giving us any emotional responses. Okay. Let's work, what's the equivalent of that that some men have felt as women started coming in, taking their jobs? What was the, what was the question that some, questions that some men asked? Are you good at making the coffee or are you good at typing? Are you good at taking steno or are you good at shorthand? And they started, many men started asking traditional questions of the females and the females said, wait a minute, I want to be respected for the equivalent of what Tom is saying, my nurturing skills. I too can be a nurturer and women were saying uh, and minorities were saying, don't just ask me questions if I'm a black person, can I open the door? Um, ask me questions of can I be an executive? Ask me a different set of questions. And so as we reverse roles, we see oftentimes that at least the, from the male perspective, he feels that what is coming out of the female mouth are questions about are you still good as an old fashioned male providing income? Am I only valuable as a male as a wallet, which is the equivalent of that's what's going to be the equivalent for men of opening up the door for blacks or, um, or being a secretary for women. Men as wallets is just a functionary role that tells you about men's subservience to women. The degree to which we expect men to earn more than women in order to receive women's love is the degree to which men experience themselves as powerless if men got in touch with their feelings. The degree to which I believe that I have to go out, when I go out, in order to, to get your love on a date that I have to pay for you, the more that I have to pay for you, the more I'm basically learning that I am unworthy of you until I pay more for you. Every male knows that as he was going out, the more attractive the woman was, the more he had to psych himself into knowing that he'd probably have to offer her more to be able to afford her. The basic statement was the more attractive she was, the less he was worth in relation to him. He, when, you, when the man learns to pay for the date, what he's learning to do is pay for the difference between what he's worth and what she is worth. If men and women were worth the same amount, we, they pay for each other about equally. But if you walk into any restaurant, the good quality restaurants, the better the quality of the restaurant, the more you can ask any maitre d' who pays the most, and you still have in the good quality restaurants between 95% and about 97% men paying when you subtract birthdays and anniversaries. That's because they still make more. They, 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 don't, they make more, but not for the same amount of work. And, and just take, take uh, in other words, not for the same amount of work, and that's for the same number of hours. Men in, uh, the, so the, high, the gross incomes of men are higher than the gross incomes of women. But the net worths of female heads of households are 141% greater than the net worths of male heads of households. 141% greater because the male spending obligations are greater. So let's, but let's work the, your original question too about uh, men, men making more. If you go out with a woman, two women are going out together and the check comes, is there a discussion, by the way, who earns more, whoever earns more will pay? 
we don't have a discussion of whoever earns more will pay. It's we just share the bill for the most part, or you take it one time and I take it the other time. But usually when men and women go out together, the first date in particular, before there's any type of commitment, there's still, in 1994, there's still an expectation that the man will pay. The woman has the option today of paying. She has the option of taking the sexual initiative. She has the option of asking the man out. The man still has the expectation of paying, the expectation of taking the sexual initiative, the expectation of asking her out. And so those are the things that the next generation of thinking about gender roles needs to question. And that, that, that applies to both blacks, whites, Hispanics, um, Chinese, and um, Jap when I was in Japan, the same type of thing in Japan as well. Thank you for sharing. You've been wonderful. And I appreciate you sharing your feelings and emotions as well. I'd like to um, do some questions and answers. I've stimulated a lot more than I'll ever be able to um, answer questions of. Janet? I have a problem with your statistics. Uh, which one? Or which the, the one about uh, asking maitre d's in a restaurant who's paying the bill. Mm -hmm. And the problem I have with it is if I look at my own situation, I'm married, mm -hmm. my husband and I both earn good money. When we go out to a restaurant, he pays the bill, but he's not paying the bill. Mm -hmm. It goes on a credit card and it comes in and our joint incomes are paying that bill. Mm -hmm. So you're making an assumption that just because the male lays down the credit card or signs the check that he's paying the bill, and I don't believe that to be the case. So I think your statistic twists things. Got you. Thank you. Most of the time when I ask that question, I say to them, when you see people dating, and oftentimes the guy will say, well, how do I know, you know who's dating? And then I say, well, you know who's dating. Um, because you can usually, you know, the conversation between men and women is, <laughs> men and women talk a great deal on the first date, and they talk a great deal just before they get divorced. Um, but, <laughs> but, in, but, in, but in between, there are different patterns of conversation. And most maitre d's um, and waiters know what I mean by that. But sometimes I do ask the question just the way you asked. And when I ask the the question the way you ask it, uh, then I could get a distorted answer uh, exactly the way that you, you just mentioned. Um, but when I ask them to sort of pinpoint it. But let's ask a deeper question. Some of you have daughters and you have sons. And you and just think about when your son and your daughter go have gone out and whether there was whether the female, your daughter, had the option of paying, but your son had the expectation of paying. And so I in my work with junior high school kids and high school kids, there's a point in time where the junior high school girl feels very liberated to ask the boy out and also sometimes to even pay. But about this junior, senior, or fresh sophomore year in high school, you often find a new hierarchy uh, coming where the, attra where the attractive girls basically inform the other girls that the attractive girls don't need to do the paying and don't need to do the, the asking. And so the girls often feel like there's something wrong with them if they have to do the paying and they have to do the asking. And so we're still dealing with that today. As a, and and the, what I'm talking about here in the deeper sense of, of Janet's implication is that what we need to be working with in the next 25 years is not a women's movement angry at men and not a men's movement angry at women, but a gender transition movement where both sexes are trying together to sort of say, we are both caught in roles that were functional for stage one in survival. Those roles have, the, we've survived enough to be able to take on new roles in stage two and the basic role of stage two is not having to play a role but we are all in this together. I know very few heterosexual men who are not addicted to beautiful young women. 
I know very few women who don't tend to marry up. That is, women will have sex today with women, men who earn less. They will even live with women, men who learn less. <laughs> but they rarely marry men who, when they marry them, they believe will always be earning less for the rest of their life. The biggest single area of discrimination in, in the world today is the propensity of women to marry men who they believe when they marry them will earn more. And the difficulty with that is that oftentimes when the woman doesn't, when the man does not earn more, there's often disappointment and anger on both sides of the coin. And so we need to do re-socialization of both sexes around that issue. And that's not anyone's fault. It was functional